this made a lot of sense, uh, as uh, these notes did at 1246 this morning. But at 9 o'clock, I wasn't so sure. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. Joe, I was talking to him yesterday, and he was up here, what, two weeks ago? Three weeks ago? Something like that, whatever. Anyway, I, I told him, I said, well, I think it's going to be pretty short this morning. He goes, yeah, I thought that too, he said. And he said, so 10 minutes equals 50. I said, hmm, that's five times. So I said, so 20 equals what? So y'all relax, we'll be here a while. No, I'm kidding. Um, interestingly enough, today is in focus. And so I wanna start by showing you a picture. Next one, please, next slide, there we go. Y'all seen that picture before? I told Lily, I said, if anybody says yes, I'm going to have to pray for him right there. Okay, so, so it's kind of hard, right? I will guarantee you there's a picture there, um, but there's a problem with it. It's not very clear, but if we clear it up a little bit on the next one, now have you all seen that? If you ever Facebook, you've seen this, right? And it says, the idea is with all these owls to find the one cat that's in there, okay? So... I'm going to help you out because we don't have a lot of time to do search. And if you haven't ever found it, I'm going to show you where it's at. We're going to circle it. That is the cat hiding there in the middle of all the owls. And if we blow it up to the next slide, you'll see it's even closer. And now you can see he doesn't have a beak. He's got a nose, right? So I did this today. I wanted an illustration, something a little bit different. Hopefully something that will stick in your minds because... Because what we're going to be talking about, or what I'm going to be talking about, <laughs> is focus. Because when you look at a picture like that and see all that confusion, and I say find the cat, it's not that easy to do because you're trying to look for patterns or you're looking for some kind of clarity in the middle of all of that confusion. And I'm going to start, uh, today we're going to be looking in Luke. Now, I'm going to, there's two different passages we're going to kind of focus on. I'm going to move on them pretty quickly. The first one's going to be in Luke. Now, Luke 21, most people, when they talk about prophetic stuff that Jesus said, they always revert to Matthew 24, which is, is excellent. This is the same thing, only from a little bit different perspective, because this is the way Luke wrote it. And there's some things in there that I just wanted to, to use it. It just works a little better for what I'm talking about this morning. But Luke 21.10 starts out with the word then. And so that tells me that anytime there's a then or a therefore, I need to go back and look and see what's before it so I can keep that verse in context. And I always tell the kids, if you guys are reading and you see the word therefore or then, go back and read and catch the context because false doctrine and false teachers and false religions are out there and what they do, they start with the therefore, they forget the context and sometimes you can make a scripture appear to mean something else if you don't have it in the context and it's that way in any language, okay? English, French, Spanish, any of those languages, anytime you take something out of context, you can, it can sometimes take on, appear to take on a different meaning. So, what's happening in Luke 21 uh, in the preceding verses to 10 is they're looking at the temples it's the thing about look how beautiful the temples are they're adorned with all this beautiful stuff and that's when Jesus is telling them yeah take a good look because one stone's not going to be left upon another there's a time coming when when that's going to happen he talks about false Christ coming <laughs> and saying you know here I here I am and he's saying don't believe that stuff so that's the the lead up to what happens in uh in verse 10 so in verse 10 says then he continued by saying and of course continued by was added by the uh, translators to clarify the statement then he continued by saying to them nation will rise against nation kingdom against kingdom and there will be massive earthquakes and in various places plagues and famines and there will be terrible sights and great signs from heaven now this passage of scripture, most all theologians will, when they start breaking it down, you're going to find out that what Jesus is doing while he's talking to the disciples about this is he's talking about two different time periods, okay? I don't know if he said it. I was telling Lily, we don't know if he said it all at one time or if he talked about this piece and that piece and when they recorded it, they recorded it together. It's all stuff, but some of the prophecy in here most scholars believe happened in 70 AD when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. So I'm going to kind of skip over that part because I just, 
It, I'm not throwing it away. We're not redacting. It's not CIA. All I'm doing is focusing on the other parts because I don't want to get into breaking all that stuff down. I want us to just focus on a few things. So, as you'll see what's going on here, so we're going to jump on down to uh, verse 25. There will be signs in the sun and moon, still Jesus talking, and on the earth distress among nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting from fear and the expectation of things that are coming upon the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Next slide. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now we know that hasn't happened, okay? So that was the part of the prophecy Jesus is talking about that's on ahead in the future and kind of what we're going to look at today. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. That's from the NASB. But I like the way the New King James says it because of the, term, the word it uses. Both are correct. If you look at the Greek, it's just the translators chose a different word for each one. Straighten up. But the New King James and the King James say, look up and lift up your heads. I like that look up because when all these things are starting to happen, if we're looking up, that signifies doing what? Looking for Jesus. Okay? Because that's the redemption that's drawing near. For the Christian, that's our promise. That's our hope. That's our future. And that's what we're talking about. I, I showed you this because I think we have to agree there's a lot of confusion and even chaos in our world right now. I'm, I turned 60 last November. And I remember, I grew up, you know, in the 60s with the Vietnam War and watching TV. My dad was a news hound. He watched all of them, the local news, the national news. Any news that came on that TV was always on the news. I, got, I hated it, okay? It wasn't entertaining to me. <laughs> but that's what was on. And we had one TV. The first one was a black and white admiral. Now I am telling you, see, you remember those? I mean, there was, there was more TV than there was TV screen. It was all these tubes and stuff and a huge cabinet, a little TV screen about like that, black and white. But I remember it, and I remember seeing these pictures. And as a kid, I didn't know. I didn't really understand the war. I didn't understand what was going on in Vietnam. I didn't understand the politics. I didn't understand when the president came, president came on and started talking. I didn't understand what he was talking about. I was too young. It didn't make sense to me. But I remember it, and as I'm older, it's still vivid in my head because I saw it, I heard it, and I remember it. But in all those years, I've said all that to say this, even through the riots of the 60s, I have never seen in my life a time when it seemed like there was more confusion and more division in our country than I see right now. I have not seen it. And it's sad because I grew up believing that we celebrated what we had in common, not what we had difference. Okay? And that was the way I was taught. So this, this is confusion because now we've got one group of people against another group of people. We've got one belief system against another belief system. And, and the problem is, you know, the problem is we're not able to come to any consensus. Uh, and this isn't a political statement, but I mean, look at the fighting among the political parties and even within the parties themselves. I've never seen that before. People are just divided. Well, makes sense, because guess what, just what Jesus said, a kingdom divided against itself? Can't stand. What's the devil trying to do? He's trying to destroy us. Why? Because we were a nation that used to send out all the, the missionaries, and guess what? Other countries, China is sending missionaries to the United States. That's where we are. That's the confusion. And we have experts, even just the simple thing like, uh, and I'm, I'm setting this up to go to a, a deal here, but even the experts on this, on the whole COVID thing the last year and a half, and it seemed like every conversation you had with anybody, it either started with that or you ended up on it, right? Because it was a serious deal. But you have experts not even agreeing on what we needed to do to control the thing. What do you believe? I'm not an expert. You know, I'm not a scientist. I, I don't understand. I don't have ways to test it. And that created confusion. It also created division. All right? Even among Christians and in churches and that's sad okay but that was what the devil has been trying to do each one of us have a right and I, I'm, this is a sidebar but I got to say it each Christian each one of us here have an opinion each one of us have a way to look at things and as Christians we got to grant the grace to each other to be able to disagree okay and that's going to happen and if you're on the internet watching from some other church you know get with the program 
If we can't forgive each other and we can't live in the grace, how are we ever going to share that with somebody else that doesn't know Jesus as Savior? Hope y'all don't fire me after this, but I can't help it. Anyway, <laughs> the thing is, that's where we are as a nation. And I'm going to tell you that I talk to Christians from different churches. I got friends from everything, all the years of playing music. I talk to different people. Man, it's easy to get depressed. I don't even look at, I don't watch the news. I read because I think we need to know what's going on. But let me tell you what was happening. I started obsessing about it. Okay? I started being obsessed with what was going on. I started getting angry. I was spending all my time angry. I told Lily, I said, I'm mad all the time. And I knew why. Because I was frustrated with all the stuff that was going on. That's when God slapped me again. And he said, what are you doing? I knew. I had it wasn't exact words, but I knew that's what he was saying. And I said, okay, I need to see what God says to do in this situation. Well, what did he say? Jesus was telling them all this bad stuff's going to happen. And he said, but when you see it start happening, look up. Don't get caught up in the junk. Don't look at all the owls running around. Don't get caught up in that confusion and that junk and that mess. Look up. It's not a negative thing. How many of you all have ever prayed for Jesus to come back? I have. Okay. Maybe you haven't, but I have. I've said, Lord, we're ready for you. Come on back. Get things in order. Let's, let's have that, that life that's promised, that eternal that peace and hope and wonderful stuff. But guess what? When you pray that, you know what you're also praying for? All the stuff he talked about because he said this is going to happen first. That's why he was telling disciples this is going to happen. So don't let it drag you down. Don't let it bog you down. It just means I'm coming back. Look up. Be ready for it. Be happy. As Christians, we should celebrate the fact that things that, that possibly, even in our lifetime, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. But I can tell you this, 2,000 years ago, none of what's going on right now caught him by surprise today. 2,000 years ago, he said, this stuff is going to happen. And it's happening. Now, whether he comes back in my lifetime or not doesn't matter. But one way or the other, I can guarantee you this. Sometime within the next hundred years, everybody who's sitting here in this room will be standing before God. One way or the other. Okay? So what do we need to do? We need to obey what he says. And he said, look up. Don't let it drag you down. Don't let it put you in the dirt. Don't, don't talk about all this. Let's talk about the positive thing. Jesus is coming back. We need to grab a hold of that hope and trust. Hebrews 11 it has been known as the faith chapter. They call it the hall of faith. They've called it the hall of fame of faith. Uh, because it's all about these people in the Old Testament. These Moses and Abraham, the father of faith, who moved when God said go. Enoch, there's just a whole list of the people of faith. And then the writer of Hebrews goes on. We're going to look at to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, the first two verses, we see this. Therefore... That's why I was telling you what happened before, because there's that word again, therefore, well, since we have all these people I've just told you about who are our cloud of witnesses, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And right there, that last part, before we go to the next slide, we're not serving a God who's just, we're serving an alive person, okay? That's what I want you to get. He's alive. He's there at the right hand of God. Let's, uh, let's go on to the next. Okay, here's another picture. Now, as we look at this scripture, you can see, not real clear. So if I said to you, I pretend that there's a door and I opened it up and I said now there's your race that I want you to run go into that and you'd be going like <laughs> yeah right because you don't know what's there right let's go to the next slide see he says let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance not just walk along easy he wanting us to run move forward with purpose with reason but that's not very secure. But what happens if we focus? Next slide. If we focus, we can see the path. Okay? 
we're focusing on Jesus, he's going to light the path. Says he's, he, uh, your words are light into my path, Old Testament. He lightens it. But if you had to run into that the other way, it's a very good possibility you're going to get wet. Because you couldn't see, right? So Jesus says, look to me. The writer of Hebrews says, look up. Next slide. So what do we need to do? Rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which easily entangles us. It could be sin. Um, there's some bad, sad things that happen, even in well-known churches here recently where pastors, one pastor, I, it really made me sad because of the way, I don't want to get into any details, but I read the article and I thought, man, that is not the way the church should have reacted. That pastor messed up, yes, he did. But the way the church reacted, it was like destroying the pastor instead of doing what Scripture says, try to bring them back, bring a support. Should he have stepped down? Yeah, he should. And that, that would have happened. But the church really needed to support him. Again, one of those things that we need to be acting like Christians, acting like Jesus would do. D Jesus didn't destroy people for doing something wrong. He tried to bring reconciliation back to the Father. Otherwise, we'd be all hopeless right now. Okay, so the things that entangle us, though, don't necessarily have to be what you would call a bad sin. It doesn't have to be something that we're indulging ourselves in. It can be a distraction that just keeps us from, from creating or from growing our relationship with the Lord. And that's what he's talking about. And run with endurance, with a purpose, and doing what? Looking only to Jesus the originator. I left that little A. This came off Bible Gateway. I left that little A because I want to talk about that word. This is why I always say, <laughs> I mean, I have, I have a couple different translations of Bible sitting on the shelf, don't I, babe? <laughs> this is NASB, which most of this came from today. But I, the, they're all the scriptures. Um, I have different ones, and I look at them, and then if I don't figure out what I'm trying to figure out, I'll go into the Greek and start looking at the Greek. So that word originator is an okay translation. Um, I'm going to tell you what I found. NASB's originator, King James, New King James, says author. New International calls that word pioneer of our faith. The ESV, another English Standard Version, calls it the founder of our faith. And the NLT calls him the initiator of our faith. And so if you're looking at that, all those words are similar, but a little bit different. So you have to think, why, why do all these translations differ? Well, let me tell you why. While they're all okay translations, it's because that word is hard to translate. I, I am not going to say I am a great, um, you know, I'm an accomplished speaker, but I'm not just an English speaker. I spoke French, and then now I clobber through my Spanish more than one language and I will tell you there have been times that Lily's translated for me when I'm preaching there and she'll stop a minute she'll go what are you trying to say and so I have to explain to her real quickly what it is the point and she'll go oh okay and then she knows how to put it out there where people can understand it okay sometimes scriptures like that there'll be these things we're talking about what does that mean and to get the rich depth of it, most of the time it's, you know, basic doctrine, we know that. But this is such a cool word. Because the originator, that word literally means this. Properly, the first in a long procession, a file leader who pioneers the way for many others to follow. And it does not strictly mean author, but rather a person who is originator or founder of a movement and continues as the leader. That's a pretty rich word and description. Now you see why each one of them tried to pick a word? You can't describe it with just one word in any translation because it basically means focus on him. He is everything. Everything to do with the faith. That's what you could say. That'd even be a better word. He's everything to do with the faith. He started it. He's going to finish it. He's going to lead it. He is the person of it. He is the reason for it. And if we have him in our life, guess what? We're part of it because it's connected to him. That's what that scripture is trying to say. That's the whole of scripture. If you start looking, it's about relationship. These guys are talking about a relationship with Jesus, not just lip service, not just, not just knowledge, but a real 
relationship with the Lord. Everything, he's, he's all. He's our eternal hope. <clears throat> 16, uh, next slide, which would be slide, there we go. We have to look up. In this mess that's going on, it's okay. All right? Do our part. Speak the truth. But don't, don't get drugged down by it. We're not hopeless. We have hope. We need to look up. I like the, what some of the translations um, say, next slide, the next one, fix your eyes. They don't just say look to him only. They say fix your eyes on Jesus. Fixing your eyes is more than just looking to, it is looking to only, but that, it's just a deeper, to me, to fix your eyes, you're looking and you just don't take them off. And there was a point in time when Peter, if you guys remember when he stepped out of the boat, he probably wished he'd have remembered that. Okay? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Don't be distracted. That's literally what it means. Don't let the world be the thing that controls your emotions and how you feel and what you think. And don't let it steal your hope. Jesus is our hope. Slide 18, the next one. Oh, well, you just were right on top of that, weren't you? Fix our eyes on Jesus by developing our relationship with him and by sharing the hope we have in Jesus with others. I will tell you that the quickest way to grow in a relationship with anybody is when you are doing something together with a common goal. Okay? So if we partner with Jesus like we're supposed to and let the Holy Spirit work through us, and we don't, all we do is be available. I guess that's what I want to say. We have to be available. Because we don't do the work. I mean, yeah, it kind of looks that way. But the real work happens when the Holy Spirit brings conviction. The real work happens when Christ saves them. We don't save anybody. But you will grow in relationship as you begin to share the hope we have in Jesus with other people. I often wonder, um, you know... I'm not saying go door to door, knock on a door, and slap somebody over the head with the Bible and say, Hey... You need to accept Jesus as Savior. You don't have to do that. What we have to do is you have to walk the walk, talk the talk. We have to live it out, and people will see it, and they will ask questions because they will see something different. They will see hope. And people right now in our world are looking for hope. When Jesus said that the, the field is white unto harvest, man, we have a white field out there right now ready, ready to be people ready to come to the Lord because they're looking for hope. And that's what we're supposed to be, the hope. So that's what we need to do. So if, uh, and if the Lord's calling you, we were just, I mean, not everybody's called to be an evangelist. Not everybody's called to preach, you know, this type of thing. Not everybody's called to teach. Some people, that's not their calling. But everybody's called to pray. Everybody's called to to walk the walk. Everybody's called to share Jesus in whatever way that he gives you to do it. And it's unique for each individual person. I hear really cool stories sometimes. Somebody will say, hey, you're not going to believe what happened. I'm like, well, I, I probably will believe it, but probably be exciting, so tell me. So this morning, if you know Jesus and you have a relationship with him, then it's just a matter of qualifying, am I seeking him? Am I seeking what he wants in my life? Am I seeking to hear from him? The closer you get to him, the easier it is to hear when he's speaking and to know how he speaks to you. And he speaks to everybody differently because we're different. Um, I don't have time to share. <clears throat> well, I do, but I'm, I'm still not going to do it. Um, I, <laughs> I'm not going to share all the details. Let me put it like that. But I will tell you this. I had been seeking God to speak to me. I was in a desert time. I was not hearing. I, and I kept telling Lily, I said, it's just like I'm not hearing. I'm asking, but I'm not hearing anything. That happens. Sometimes God is silent. And I did a message on that sometime back when he's silent. I forgot to take heed of what I was telling everybody else. But um, I finally remembered. I look back at my notes. Anyway... Um, so the other day, and just, just a real quick story. So the other day, I was in Cameron, and I was going to stop by Walmart, and then I was like, nah, I, I can get by without this. But for some reason, I was just like, yeah, okay, i got to go to Walmart. I, I'll go do it, you know. 
I got up there, I got out of my car, and just a real quick thing that happened. All of a sudden, these two ladies come up, and they hand me a gospel track. And I looked at it because I was wanting to know what, what, you know, what church it came from. And I looked, and I thought, okay, same thing I believe. And I looked at it, and I said, I really appreciate you witnessing to me. I think it's a waste, but I already know Jesus. I already have a relationship with Jesus. Oh, really? We got into this conversation, and they shared something with me. It was a confirmation of something that I had been felt led that God was telling me, but I really didn't feel it was confirmed. And out of nowhere, these people came. That was the way God chose to speak to me that day. That may never happen again, but that time, and I was receptive and open to it. So I guess what I'm saying is just seek him, keep your eyes focused on him, stay, stay hopeful. We got hope in Jesus, and let's share that hope with others. Let's stand together and we'll pray. And as the worship team comes. Lord, we thank you for your word. I thank you that in the middle of all the chaos and confusion, just like the song, the song says, you are sovereign still. And as we said, there's none but you, Jesus. You are the hope. You are our hope. And like the other song, and, and, and it's all about you. May we remember that. If there's anybody here or anybody watching online who does not know you as Savior, I pray that this morning, speak to their heart. Let them know the reality of who you are. And Lord, if we need to rededicate, if we're kind of strayed a little bit, we're not really here and we haven't really been developing our relationship, Lord, may we in our hearts make a commitment to you this morning to come back to fixing our eyes on you. Let us know what's going on in the world, but not get caught up in it and not get drugged down by it because we need to remember our hope. And that's what I'm asking this morning. And that we share that hope with others who don't know you, that they too may be able to have joy even in the midst of confusion and chaos. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.